All right, okay. Uh, greetings to all of you. Hope you're all doing good. Um, today we have two outstanding speakers, um, Dr. Fabrizio Chitti from uh, Florence, Italy, and Dr. Jin Lee from Stanford. I also would like to welcome Dr. Michael van der Skuller from Cambridge. Um, he will introduce uh, Dr. Chitti and he will handle the Q&A for the first speaker. And then I will follow up that with the second speaker's presentation. So with that, Miguel, go ahead, get started. Thank you, Rams. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Kitty. Um, he did his PhD, um, or rather his DPhil, as they call it there, in Oxford with Chris Dobson. Uh, must be 20 years ago. And uh, I mean, I met him at that time, and he was really making great uh, strides in understanding the um, principles of protein aggregation. He really helped uh, establishing the uh, general principle that uh, the amyloid state is a generic state uh, of proteins. And uh, in fact, his reviews uh, on this topic are among the most uh, cited and really a reference in the field. After his uh, PhD, he returned to Florence, his native uh, town, uh, as an assistant professor, uh, where he continued to make uh, fundamental contributions to uh, understanding uh, protein aggregation, in particular, uh, the physical chemical principles leading to this process, as well as the role of uh, the oligomers that are formed as intermediates on the way to cellular toxicity. And uh, I think today he will uh, uh, talk about his most recent findings uh, on this uh, topic. So Fabrizio, um, please, uh, you are welcome to start your seminar. Thank you, Michele, for your very nice uh, presentation. I'm really uh, glad that you uh, introduced me. And uh, today I would like to speak about uh, uh, how we can displace uh, toxic protein oligomers from the membrane using uh, a class of uh, novel and very promising molecules, which are aminosterols. And I would like to start with this uh, uh, slide that I'm sure you have seen many times in slightly different forms. Here we have all the possible conformational changes occurring for a polypeptide chain after biosynthesis, which includes folding, uh, um, adoption of quaternary structure and uh, conformational changes uh, as a function of ligand binding uh, and so on. But we have something undesired that can occur for, uh, um, for proteins, which is aggregation. Actually, proteins can aggregate and they can do that from different conformational states, including even the native state or native-like states, but in particular from partially folded states, which have the highest propensity to aggregate. And even the proteolysed fragment that um, result from, proteolo from proteolysis can uh, uh, result into aggregation. Aggregation initially is something that has some conformational memory of the initial aggregate, of the initial conformational state that generated that. But in the end, this will generally reorganize into beta structure aggregates until amyloid fibrils can form. And there are um, other types of protein aggregates that can form, including native like deposits or amorphous deposits. And uh, uh, it is increasingly recognized that in neurodegeneration, it's the um, these uh, prefibrillar oligomers that can, the, these prefibrillar, prefibrillar, uh, prefibrillar aggregates that can cause uh, uh, dysfunction. And so we became interested in understanding how the oligomers, the protein misfolded oligomers can cause cell dysfunction and what type of structural elements they have to cause cell dysfunction. And we could take advantage of three proteins in particular. One is a model protein, hyperfen, and then we have alpha synuclein, which is a protein associated with Parkinson's disease, and the amyloid beta peptide, which is associated with uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. And I'm sure you have heard about these two uh, latter proteins uh, uh, many times. And uh, these three protein systems can form pairs of toxic and non-toxic 
oligomers, including toxic type A and non-toxic type B oligomers. And uh, actually we published that in 2010, but uh, um, later on other proteins were converted into um, pairs of toxic and non-toxic type A oligomers, including the amyloid beta peptide and uh, alpha C nuclein. And this is a uh, very important in, in, uh, in this field because uh, we can actually try to understand the molecular determinants, the structural determinants of oligomer toxicity by comparative uh, studies, by a, a comparative structural analysis of uh, these oligomers, both toxic and non-toxic, to try to understand what the toxic oligomers have in structural terms that uh, is not uh, possessed by the non-toxic oligomers. So the, uh, this is one of the questions that we wanted to address. What is the mechanism of toxicity for type A oligomers? And we found that these oligomers actually can interact with the membrane. And the interaction of the toxic oligomers with the membrane is something uh, very early that occurs uh, during the toxicity cascade. Here you can see a cartoon where we have the membrane, the extracellular space and the intracellular space. If we add oligomers, these will get closer and closer to the membrane and they will interact with the membrane. Initially, the interaction will be on the surface of the membrane, but eventually they will insert into the uh, core of the membrane, into the hydrophobic portion of the membrane. And this will cause a destabilization with the entry of calcium ions. And actually, the calcium ions, which are very highly concentrated in the extracellular space, can start to enter into the cytosol. And this is dramatic for the cell because as we have an increase of calcium in the cell, there is a number of events that occur that lead to dysfunction first and eventually to apoptosis with uh, uh, an inevitable death of, for the cell. And calcium ions can enter in a non-specific manner through the holes, through the pores formed by these uh, oligomers, but also by an activation of the NMDA receptor, which appears to be activated when the membrane is destabilized. And so there is an entry of calcium through these channels. If we look at the non-toxic type B oligomers, we have an interaction with the membrane, but the interaction is only on the surface. These do not have the ability to penetrate into the hydrophobic portion of the membrane. And so the, there is no destabilization of the membrane. And so we have no insertion into the membrane, no membrane destabilization. Uh, in our collaboration with uh, uh, Nunilo Cremades and Alfonso De Simone, we also looked at the, uh, uh, at the effect of uh, oligomers from uh, alpha synuclein, and actually thanks to the, uh, the NMR work uh, carried out by Alfonso De Simone in particular, we, we could understand why these uh, toxic oligomers can, uh, uh, can destabilize the membrane. Actually, the oligomers in this case, they have some um, um, exposed and flexible N-termini. And so the N-termini portion of the um, oligomer can interact with the membrane and adopt an alpha helical structure. And this is the first molecular event. But then eventually the structured core of the oligomer will penetrate into the membrane, destabilizing the membrane. And uh, Alfonso also did uh, uh, an analysis for the, um, for the non-toxic type A oligomers. In that case, he found uh, an interaction with the membrane, but there is no insertion. In that case, there is no destabilization of the membrane. So a picture very similar to that observed for uh, hyperfan oligomers. And here we, you can see a summary of the reason why toxic type A oligomers for uh, hyperfan are toxic and why the other uh, type is non-toxic. Well, from uh, a morphological point of view, they are very similar. They, they share similar diameter. They both contain beta sheet structure. 
but the hyperfen oligomers are more, the, the toxic species are more structured. They have a, a structured end terminus. The um, type um, B oligomers are less structured. They have a flexible, a flexible end terminus. And uh, these uh, structural uh, constraints in the toxic oligomers uh, allow the formation of solvent exposed hydrophobic residues. Because of this uh, constraint, these uh, 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 structured toxic oligomers can expose on the surface some hydrophobic residues. And because of the flexibility of the non-toxic species, these hydrophobic portions can be buried because the flexibility allow these uh, uh, hydrophobic groups to escape from the contact of the solvent and get buried inside, uh, inside the oligomer. So eventually we have a solvent exposure of hydrophobic residues that is responsible for membrane interaction. And for the alpha-synuclein oligomers, we have uh, uh, non-toxic type A oligomers, which are actually disordered, flexible, they are very similar in terms of uh, uh, size. Uh, they are also um, similar in terms of size. Um, in this case, we have no secondary structure formation for the non-toxic species and uh, some beta sheet structure for the toxic species. The non-toxic species are less compact and we have more compaction for the toxic species. And uh, we have some difference in solvent exposure we have buried hydrophobic residues for the non-toxic species and solvent exposed hydrophobic residues for the toxic species. So again, uh, a similar picture relative, um, similar picture and, and comparable to that of IPFN oligomers. And so we wanted to understand whether we can detach the oligomers from the membrane and uh, a couple of molecules isolated from uh, the shark were very useful from that point of view. The molecules are squalamine and uh, trodesquamine. And you can see these uh, molecules, they are very similar in terms of structure. There is a, a polyamine group for squalamine that is shorter compared to that of trodesquamine. And uh, actually, these uh, molecules were isolated for, for different reasons in 1993, in the case of squalamine and 2000 for trudesquamine. Actually, at that time, there was uh, an intensive search of natural compounds with antimicrobial activity. And this is why these two molecules were discovered, because people were looking for uh, interesting molecules to be used as antibiotics. But starting from 2017, these molecules were um, studied for their effects on urine degeneration. And surprisingly, they, they were found to be very useful even for counteracting urine degeneration, particularly Parkinson's disease. And uh, so particularly in, uh, um, um, I still love to call it Chris Dobson's group because at that time, Chris Dobson was a very active before he passed away. Now I would say in Thomas Knowles and Michael Vendroskolo's group, um, they studied a number of things to understand the effect of these molecules on the aggregation of alpha-synuclein. And first they found that squalamine displaces alpha-synuclein from liposomes. And we are not talking about oligomers in that case, but of the uh, monomer of alpha-synuclein. And here you can see the secure dichroism spectra. This is the spectrum typical of uh, alpha-synuclein interacting with the membrane with a lot of alpha-helical structure. And this is the disorder spectrum for alpha-synuclein isolated from the membrane. You can see that as we add uh, trodesquamine, we have uh, a detachment from the membrane because the CD spectrum uh, um, uh, changes from the alpha helical spectrum typical of alpha synuclein bound to the membrane to the uh, disordered spectrum typical of alpha synuclein uh, isolated from the membrane. And so this is the first important effect of squalamine, which in, in, um, de um, detaches the 
uh, monomer from the membrane. So it doesn't allow the monomer to interact with the membrane. Uh, but also aggregation is uh, inhibited. Actually, you can see here the time course of aggregation for uh, the, the sample in the absence of trodesquamine. As we add trodesquamine, we have a, a, a slowing down of the process. So the lipid induced aggregation is inhibited by trodesquamine. Fibril elongation is not inhibited by trodesquamine. And if we uh, study the effect, uh, the, the aggregation in the presence of low concentration of seeds, we can see some slowing down again. So in the end, if, if you look at the writings uh, at the bottom, we can see that primary nucleation is inhibited, fibril elongation is not inhibited, and secondary nucleation is inhibited. So we can summarize through a cartoon. This is the complex aggregation of alpha synuclein where the monomers need to interact with the membrane. Then we have primary nucleation, secondary fibular elongation, and secondary nucleation. And these, these are the uh, micro steps uh, inhibited by alpha synuclein, which is uh, the binding of uh, the monomer to the membrane, primary nucleation, and secondary nucleation. And uh, uh, but there is uh, another important effect that these molecules are doing. Actually, they can uh, suppress the toxicity uh, of preformed alpha synuclein oligomers. So, um, suppose that the oligomers form, they can um, they they are no longer uh, harmful or toxic if we add uh, trodesquamine. Actually, in this uh, picture, you can in this uh, histogram you can see the effect. Uh, of uh, toxicity using the MTT reduction test. These, is, these are the untreated cells that reduce uh, MTT to 100%, so implying that the cells are fully healthy. If we add trodesquamine, we don't see an effect, so trodesquamine is not toxic per se. If we add the oligomers, we have toxicity. But if we, have, if we add the oligomers in the presence of trodesquamine, we have a reduction of toxicity. You can see that the levels of toxicity reaches that of the untreated cell 100%. So trodesquamine can actually suppress the toxicity of preformed alpha synuclein oligomers. This is another readout of toxicity. We can monitor the um, formation of ROS and we have the untreated cells with trodesquamine. We have very little, in, very little oxidative stress. In the presence of the oligomers, we have oxidative stress with a large production of ROS. When we add trudesquamine, we have a decrease of ROS. So why does trudesquamine inhibit? Why does trudesquamine suppress the toxicity of preformed oligomers? And the reason is summarized in this slide. Actually, the oligomers can uh, um, attach to the membrane. Here you can see the membrane of the cells in red, the alpha syn uh, the oligomers in green, and you can see that the oligomers interact with the, membr with the membrane. When we add trodesquamine, you can see that there are lower and lower aggregates attached to the membrane. At the highest um, concentration of trodesquamine tested, we, we have no oligomers at all interacting with the membrane. So the oligomers are able to um, suppress the toxicity of the oligomers by displacing the oligomers from the membrane. In the presence of trodesquamine, these uh, toxic species are no longer able to interact with the membrane of the cells. And so we have seen this picture already. We can add uh, one more uh, effect. Uh, the, um, these aminosterols can these molecules can uh, uh, displace the oligomers or uh, um, they, they can inhibit the interaction of the oligomers with the membrane. And uh, thanks to Michele Perni working in uh, Michele's group, we could uh, uh, see the, um, the, 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 dis the displacement effect and the lack of toxicity because actually you can see here, uh, these are worms uh, 
expressing a C elegance. They are basically C elegance expressing alpha synuclein coupled with a, a fluorescent protein. You can see all the inclusions. And uh, in the presence of trodesquamine, we cannot see any more inclusions or a lower amount of inclusions. Uh, when we add the trodesquamine at larval stage, uh, day four of larval, larval stage, when we add trodesquamine at uh, day five of adulthood, we don't see any, um, any inclusions at all. And here you can see the quantification, but more importantly, you can see what is the effect of the movement of the uh, worms. Uh, by looking at the total fitness score. So these are the uh, wild type, uh, the wild type uh, uh, worms, where we can see a good fitness. And these are the PD worms, so the worms expressing alpha synuclein, uh, which have a lower uh, uh, fitness score. When we add trodesquamine at larval stage number four or trodesquamine at, at day five of adulthood, we can see an increase of the fitness up to the levels of the wild type forms that do not express alpha synuclein at all. And this is the survival curves. And you can see that uh, when we add to this women, we have a better survival of the worms. And actually here you can see a cartoons. These are the uh, wild type worms that move uh, very effectively. And these are the worms expressing alpha synuclein. And they still can move, but with uh, difficulties. And here you can see the worms uh, uh, expressing alpha synuclein, so the, uh, the unhealthy uh, worms in the presence of trodesquamine, they can go back to the fitness typical of the wild type worms. Okay, so following this result, squalamine has entered the human, human clinical trials in 2018 for the treatment of Parkinson's disease by the company Enterin, which was funded by Michael Zasloff. And this was a, a very important achievement. Actually, Michael Zasloff was the discoverer of these uh, molecules and he founded this company to see, the, whether, to see whether we can exploit these molecules for uh, as drugs, basically. And so following these uh, results obtained, uh, um, in, in, at, at the various levels of science, so from the biophysics to the, uh, to the um, C elegance model system, uh, he could uh, um, start a clinical trials that uh, um, has just ended the phase 2B. Actually, this was announced uh, just last week, and there will be probably a seminar next week to disclose this uh, phase 2B, which seemed to be very promising. And this is very important because uh, uh, this can uh, uh, allow the, the, the initiation of a phase three clinical trial, which is the, uh, the last one um, before, the, before a drug can go to the market. And there is also an attempt to design through this I mean, deriv derivatives for clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease, but here uh, um, I think uh, the company is not yet ready to start a clinical trial. So the one of the things that we wanted to answer is how do squalamine or trodesquamine displace alpha synuclein monomers and oligomers from the cell membrane? So we, so far we, with the data that I've shown you so far, we could uh, see that there is a displacement effect. So these molecules can actually displace the oligomers from the membrane, but how? What is the mechanism? How can these molecules displace the oligomers? So first, uh, these molecules bind to the membrane. These, uh, um, we have evidence collected in my lab showing that the molecules can actually interact physically with the membrane. And this is clear with a number of techniques. And for the sake of time, I will not go through these, uh, these uh, 
uh, results. So there is an evidence that the molecules can interact with the membrane, but what does they change to the membrane? First of all, using QCM, we could see that there is an insertion and we could see the details, the uh, geometric details of this insertion. We could calculate a surface molecular area of uh, about 95 uh, angstrom raised to the, to the square. And we could uh, see a thickness uh, of the insertion of 5.6 angstrom. And uh, we could uh, also calculate the angle of the insertion about five, 55 degrees. So the molecule can insert into the membrane with an angle of uh, 55 degrees and with a particular orientation and uh, can uh, dig into the membrane, but only partially because this molecule is about 15, is about, uh, uh, um, 15 angstrom thick, so the, there is only a partial insertion into the membrane. And you can better see these molecular dynamics that were carried out with uh, Gianvito Grasso uh, in Switzerland uh, that uh, can uh, show results compatible with these experimental results obtained with QCM, the insertion, the partial insertion of trudespamine, and you can see better the movie here. So the, the purple and the green is the membrane, are the two layers of the membrane, and this is uh, through the squamine. And uh, if we start the movie, we can see the insertion, and you can see that through the squamine doesn't insert completely. There's also always a head that stick out of the membrane. You can better appreciate that with this uh, uh, molecular dynamics showing the um, the molecular structure. And you can see that polyamine, which is this uh, big stick, is always uh, on the exterior of the membrane. So there is only a partial insertion into, into the membrane. So if we try to convert uh, these uh, movies in uh, data, we can see the density map and this is the bilayer thickness with the head group, the hydrophobic tails, the head group, the hydrophobic tails. So this is the typical disposition of the two of the lipids into the bilayer. And this is the space occupied by trudescomy. So there is an insertion into the membrane, but you can see just on the polar head region and partially into the hydrophobic region. And actually, trodesquamine never gets at the interface between the two layers. It remains only in this portion of the membrane. And then we use the FRET approach to study the mean minimal distance between a lipid labeled with a donor and trodesquamine labeled with an acceptor. I don't know if you are familiar with FRET, just a simple scheme to see how FRET uh, works. Basically, we use a donor in blue and an acceptor in yellow. If we excite the donor, we have a transfer of energy from the donor to the acceptor, and the acceptor will emit light. But we have also an emission of light from the donor, but the light emitted from the donor is less intense because the, the energy has been partially transferred to the acceptor. So we can monitor FRET by looking at the decrease of the fluorescence intensity. And in this experiment, we labeled a lipid with a donor in blue and trodesquamine with an acceptor in yellow. And we changed the position of the donor. We, we labeled the cholesterol or GM1, or the OPC, or sphingomyelin. So we change the position of the donor to various lipids, always keeping the acceptor on trodesquamine. And we could see the results, and to cut a long story short, you can see here the results in this histogram. So the higher threat efficiency was observed for a cholesterol. Sorry and a lower fret efficiency for GM1, 
and then sphingomyelin and no threat at all with the OPC. So we have a preferential interaction of tridespomine with cholesterol, followed by GM1, followed by sphingomyelin and uh, uh, very little interaction with the, the OPC. And this, was, uh, this implies that prodesquamine interacts mainly with the lipid rafts of the membrane. I don't know if you know what the lipid rafts are. In biology, they are very important because they regulate a lot of processes on the membrane because these three lipids with a preferential interaction occupy the lipid rafts. So they, we know that uh, these molecules have a preferential interaction with the lipid rafts rather than the fluid phase of the bilayer. Okay, and uh, uh, so if we also try a different threat approach in these other, we labeled a lipid with a donor and another lipid with an acceptor. The acceptor were, was always put on cholesterol and we changed the position of the donor, GM1 or the OPC or uh, uh, sphingomyelin or cholesterol. And this is what we call the lipid-lipid threat because the, both the acceptor and the donor are on lipids. And we could see that in the presence of tridesquamine, we have cholesterol and GM1 that get farther, so they, they touch from each other. In the presence of trodesquamine, the, chol the cholesterol molecules get closer, and also the GM1 molecules get closer. So we have a, a rearrangement of the lipids in the lipid rafts, uh, and trodesquamine can actually change the disposition of the, of the lipids in the, in the lipid rafts. We also have a decrease of the charge, and charge is very important for the interaction with the, the oligomers. We well know that alpha-synuclein oligomers have a, a preferential interaction with the negative charges of the membrane, and actually these negative charges decreases because trodesquamine decreases the negative charge of LUFs. Uh, this was found with the zeta potential and DLS. And we also have uh, an increase of the transition temperature of loops. So trudesquamine can decrease the charge, and this is not surprising because it's positively charged. So we have a decrease of the negative charge of the membrane, but we also have a reinforcement of the membrane because the transition temperature increases. And so the, um, we have a arrangement of the molecular packing of the lipids with trudesquamine. We also found uh, uh, a, a higher resistance of the membrane for uh, trudesquamine because uh, um, the, in the, the breakthrough force was uh, found to increase. Actually, the breakthrough force is the force um, that we measure to uh, break the membrane. And in the absence of trudesquamine, we have uh, uh, a little breakthrough force, but in the presence of trudesquamine, the breakthrough force is higher, implying that the membrane is more resistant and we need more force, a higher force to indent, to break the membrane. And so to, to uh, um, summarize these three effects uh, into one slide, we can see that trudesquamine has three major effects. It changes the lipid distribution in the membrane, it neutralizes the negative charge of the membrane, and it increases the stability of the membrane. And these three factors are all uh, known to be important to um, make the membrane resistant to the effect of oligomers. So uh, th th there is a number of things that these molecules can do to the membrane, and they, and they do that, all these effects together, and uh, this explains why the oligomers cannot interact with the membrane if trodesquamine is there. Yes, all of them contribute to decrease the affinity of the membrane for the oligomers. So just uh, the last slide to show the conclusions, squalamine and trodesquamine protect against alpha-synuclein neurodegeneration through multiple mechanisms. We have a displacement of the monomer. We have an inhibition of primary nucleation for aggregation, inhibition of secondary nucleation, and oligomer displacement. We have encouraging clinical trials 
for uh, PD and for dementia with PD. And uh, for PD, we are just at the end of phase 2B clinical trial, and the results uh, will be announced uh, in a seminar next, next week. So this screening binds the belayer of liposomes and cells. It has three effects in certain to the polar region, this is part of the hydrophobic region of the belayer, and this uh, uh, results into three major effects, which we believe are important to explain why they protect the membrane. We have a change in the distribution of cholesterol and GM1, we have a neutralization of the negative charge of the membrane, and we have an increase of the breakthrough force of the membrane. And thank you very much for your attention. I would like to end up with this slide with, uh, um, to acknowledge all the people. Uh, I think uh, these, uh, I believe uh, that science is collegial and uh, I love this story particularly because it results from the contribution of many different laboratories. So I have to acknowledge all the people in my lab uh, and uh, laboratories at the University of Florence. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, Claudia and Martino. They also are participating to the project for the sake of time and didn't have the time to show their data today. For molecular dynamics uh, uh, um, simulation, Stefano, Gianvito and Andrea, Alfonso and Giuliana for uh, the work on alpha synuclein, people from the University of Genoa for AFM, people from the University of Cambridge for uh, uh, all the data on primary nucleation, secondary nucleation with C elegance, and Michael Zasloff, of course, and Denise Barbut, who discovered uh, and uh, synthesized these very interesting molecules. And uh, my group, uh, this is a picture of my group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabrizio, for a very clear uh, lecture. We have a couple of questions uh, for you. Um, there will be more at the end of the, also the second lecture. Uh, so the first question is uh, you know, about the C. elegance part of the work. And uh, the question is whether uh, the worms express alpha synuclein or uh, more generally if, uh, if they have a genetic predisposition for Parkinson. Well, uh, it's a good question. Of course, they are, uh, um, they are an animal model, and so they have all the limits as an animal model. What uh, uh, we know is that they express alpha synuclein, uh, as a, alpha synuclein coupled with a fluorescent protein, and uh, we have a decrease of the total fitness after the expression of alpha synuclein. And uh, so in principle, it's a good model system because it can reproduce some of the effects we can see in humans. I don't know if they have a genetic predisposition, um, particularly higher or higher than humans. Uh, we don't know that. Of course, there are animals that live for a very short time, so they need, we, we need to induce the, um, the expression at very early stages to have some clinical symptoms uh, reminiscent of Parkinson's disease. And uh, I don't know, I mean, to, to be honest, it's hard to say if the, these, uh, um, these animals have a higher predisposition relative to humans. Okay, uh, you know, in the interest of time, I suggest we keep the other questions for uh, for the end uh, because I think we are already. We quite could we there. could um, we could go on to take a few more questions. So you can. Ah, okay, that's fine. Now. That's uh, that's great then. Sure. Um, so the second question is uh, about the uh, mechanism of action of squalamine or prodeskomine on the oligomers. Um, the green fluorescence image. Mm -hmm. uh, would seem to disappear in the presence of the compound. Uh, why is that? Sorry, the, sorry, say that again, Michele. The green fluorescence. So the green fluorescence image of the oligomer mm -hmm. disappear in the uh, presence of the compound. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the um, uh, okay. So when we add the oligomers. Uh, to the cells, uh, these oligomers uh, uh, interact with the membrane, and then we have a, um, we have a washout of the cell. So everything that is not uh, interacting with the membranes cannot be seen uh, after this washout process. 
And actually in the images, if you remember, we can see this green fluorescence co-localizing with the cells because we have oligomers um, stuck onto the membrane and uh, interacting firmly with the membrane. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive the washout process. When we add uh, uh, trodesquamine, um, the oligomers uh, do, do not interact with the membrane, they interact very weakly. So when we have the washout process, all of them are, um, are um, removed from the cells. And that's why in the presence of trodesquamine, the green fluorescence is no longer evident because they, they, they cannot stay there. Okay, thank you. Um, so the effect on the rafts seem general, but the cell and organ studies suggest specificity. How do you reconcile these two views? Okay, so the, the effects on the rafts, I mean, the, um, the, the, the rafts are uh, uh, present in, two, in liposomes and also in uh, cells. And um, the, what we see when we add trodesquamine is that uh, the rafts are affected because trodesquamine goes into the rafts. And the rafts are also important for uh, toxicity. For example, the, uh, the N NMDA receptors, the AMPA receptors that mediate some of the toxic effect of the oligomers actually co-localize with the rafts. So if we have a molecule that interacts with, with the rafts, uh, we, 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 can, uh, we can easily understand why the oligomers then are no longer toxic. Okay, so another question concerns uh, the uh, potential therapeutic use of trodesquamine uh, mm -hmm. for, for brain disorders. So how much uh, do you get, uh, can you get in the brain, uh, given that uh, there is one, uh, seems to be one-to-one -one stoichiometry with the uh, with the alpha synuclein. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a complex question um, because uh, first, uh, trodesquamine, uh, um, trodesquamine has uh, uh, can um, um, cross the BBB, the blood-brain barrier, and this is very important to get uh, trodesquamine into the brain. Uh, some of the effects uh, start uh, far away from the brain, particularly for Parkinson's disease, because they, 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 there is uh, an hypothesis that is uh, particularly important now, particularly studied now, the gut-brain axis. So we, we, we know that there is a gut-brain axis and Parkinson's disease probably starts in the enteric nervous system. So even that's why uh, squalamine is effective for treating Parkinson's disease because the molecule gets into the gut and this is where it starts to have the first good effects. So it's a, it's a complex uh, question and uh, I'm not sure that I have all the answers. I'm not sure that even Michael Zasloff has all the answers to that question because we don't know how important uh, the entire nervous system relative to the brain is for, for Parkinson's disease. But uh, we have to accept the data. I mean, in the end, uh, we can see a, a very good improvement of the clinical signs of these people treating with, uh, treated with, uh, with squalamine. So there must be a good effect. I don't think it's important to have a one-to-one -one stoichiometry because uh, if we uh, inhibit uh, aggregation, you can stop the formation of some of the seeds. You can stop some of the bad effects of the oligomers. So actually some of the effects, some of the good effects that we can see are lower than a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. Certainly in the complex, in, in C. elegans, for example, we don't have to reach a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. We can see a good effect even at lower, uh, at lower concentration because uh, of the ability of these molecules to inhibit the, the lipid-induced aggregation that uh, starts at the beginning of the aggregation process. Okay, thank you. I see the next speaker is ready, so I think we can move, move to the next lecture. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Fabrizio and um, Helen, for a nice talk. We'll take other questions at the end. So we have the second speaker, Dr. Jin Hyung Lee from 
um, neuroscience and um, biomedical engineering, Stanford University. Sorry, uh, Dr. Lee, your host is not here, so I'm going to briefly introduce you. Dr. Lee received her bachelor's degree from Seoul National University and master's and doctoral degree from Stanford University, all in electrical engineering. As an, as an electrical engineer by training with neuroscience research interest, her goal is to analyze, debug, and engineer the brain circuit through innovative technology. Her, her research contribution has received many honors and awards, starting from 2008, um, receiving the K99 from NIH, then the NIH Director's New Innovator Award in 2010, Wakawa Foundation Research Grand Award in 2010, the NSF Career Award in 2011, 2012 Sloan Fellowship, 2012 uh, Epilepsy Therapy Project Award, and all the way down to 2019, uh, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, and many more. So with that brief introduction, I would like to invite Dr. Lee to present her talk. Thank you very much for the invitation, Dr. Rams, and also Fabrizio, that talk was fantastic, and I have some questions, so you have to reserve some time for me at the end. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about uh, some of our uh, research that is a little bit different in scale from what you just heard. Um, uh, my lab's research goal in general is to understand the whole brain algorithm of behavioral control with the focus of trying to use that to treat neurological conditions. And to do that, one of the main approaches that my lab has been utilizing is a combination of optogenetics with functional MRI. And this is, this is a technology that we pioneered with the understanding that to reconstruct brain circuit algorithms, you not only need cell type specific activity, but also whole brain function measurements. And while this is a little bit off topic from proteinopathies, uh, I wanna start by introducing you to some of these approaches that we're taking, which we will then circle back to protein uh, aggregation problems. And so here I wanna give you one example of us looking at the whole brain circuit function for the basal ganglia pathways. And as you all know, the basal ganglia, the canonical basal ganglia system is a single directional a circuit flow diagram, but in reality, it's a very complex whole brain multi-node feedback system where with using techniques such as electrophysiology of a couple of nodes, it's very difficult to reconstruct the whole brain uh, circuit mechanism, which is why it remains elusive. And optogenetic functional MRI combination is particularly useful for that, which is why we employed this technique to look at uh, the basal ganglia thalamocortical system. And this is where we stimulated the D1 and D2 medium spiny neurons separately uh, to look at its whole brain uh, circuit function impact and where you can see the D1 and D2 drive very distinct uh, brain function across the whole brain. And then uh, we can also look at through this approach, everything in four dimensions. So here we're, we've segmented different regions of the brain and you can see clearly the time course of it. And once we could see that, what we could do next was to reconstruct circuit diagrams. And this shouldn't be confused with anatomical connection. This is where we know that the D2, D1 medium spiny neurons and D2 medium spiny neurons in this case drive completely different functions across the whole brain. And this is a functional interaction map uh, driven by these two different neuron, neuronal types. And in the CPU here, you can see uh, the direct pathway interactions with the D2 medium spiny neurons, you see that the uh, D2 MSN doesn't drive the uh, direct pathway, but rather the indirect pathway. So you can quantitatively show the whole brain circuit maps as a circuit interaction maps, the functional interaction maps, as you can see here. And one of the things that's puzzling when you reconstruct things at the whole brain scale at the regional level, even though with cell type specificity, is that, for example, here, uh, where you go from CPU to DPI to thalamus, these are all known inhibitory connections, but we see red arrows, which suggest that activity increase in CPU increases activity in GPI and then increases activity in thalamus, which is quite contrary to our expectation, which makes you wonder why exactly that's happening. And just to confirm that this is not a result of artifacts from MRI, you can go and record in these different regions and you'll actually see that the CPU activity increase driven by the optogenetic stimulation of the D1 medium spiny neurons, increase activity in all the downstream regions. 
While this was puzzling when we were modeling things only at the regional level, uh, we then sought to model uh, the uh, the brain activity at a single cell spiking level, uh, where when we once we had the regional interaction map, it was possible to then uh, map the individual interactions of neurons within each neurons. And what we find by modeling that is explanation of the mechanism underlying why the inhibitory GABAergic connections are driving excitatory impact overall in the next node. And what we have found in our simulation, which we then confirmed with the experimental uh, recording, was that uh, the individual neurons, even though they're increasing in firing and they're indeed GABAergic connections to the next nodes, uh, the firing driven by optogenetics here increases synchrony of the activity in the neurons. All the individual neurons here overlaid together show that because of the increased synchrony, even though there is less firing before and more firing during the simulations, there are larger gaps in between this uh, activity of the neurons, which then allows the neurons downstream to fire, which results in a higher firing rate then also drives the same thing down, down the line to the thalamus. And so by having this ability to uh, model things at a single neuronal level, you are able to infer the mechanisms underlying it. And we once we saw this, we went back and looked at the uh, activity recordings that we did. Uh, we see that indeed there is synchrony increase uh, during the simulations, uh, which results in this outcome. And so, one thing that we can find during these uh, modeling is that through this modeling, we can explain mechanisms of how the interactions are occurring. And the other thing we wanna do is to be able to predict therapeutic targets. And we found this paper uh, from a recent publication uh, from this group. And one of the main findings that they found in through a lot of experimental studies was that uh, the uh, GPI was a much better target than some of the other targets in reducing beta synchrony. And even though the, those experiments were done experimentally in a lot of different conditions, which I presume was, would take quite a bit of time and uh, is most likely very difficult, uh, now that we have a whole brain uh, single cell level modeling capability, uh, we just simply simulated what would result from inhibiting the different targets that were experimentally targeted in the experiment. We found that the beta synchrony indeed only decreases with the target that they found to be effective, where we can now see here that only in the GPI inhibition, we were able to achieve beta synchrony removal. And so in this particular example, what I wanted to show you was that we have now uh, integrated all these technology to a point where we can do um, multimodal functional recording combined with optogenetic functional MRI where whole brain function can be modeled at a single cell spiking level. And using this, uh, we demonstrated that the optimal DBS target for uh, Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's disease can be predicted. And so based on, uh, while, while one of our main goal is to restore circuit functionality by understanding its mechanism and having ways to predict what the based, uh, best therapeutic target is, uh, something that cannot be ignored in uh, these um, neurological disease is the pathology underlying it. And then we wanted to understand what the pathology and function relationship was. And with uh, some of the new technology that came online, we sought to study this. And here are some of the things that uh, we wanted to understand is what exactly is the brain-wide pathology uh, spreading mechanism, uh, so to speak, and also how does this pathology relate to brain activity? And so as you may be very well familiar with, there are these protein aggregation and spreading mechanism, prion-like spreading that has recently been observed. And it has been experimentally demonstrated by various groups that indeed you inject alpha-synuclein fibrils and you can see them uh, spreading to different parts of the brain. Uh, however, we wanted to get a more quantitative look at this. And so we use 3D uh, imaging, um, 3D histology techniques combined with uh, machine learning techniques in order to quantify this. And so here, what we've done was we injected the alpha-synuclein fibrils and imaged at starting from two weeks very early on all the way to 18 months to see what the whole cycle looked like. And what we have then done was to take these two micron uh, resolution images and then use machine learning to do automated uh, plaque segmentation, uh, such as seen here, and also then register to the atlas in order to get all the regional information associated with it. 
And this, using uh, this approach, we can look at the alpha-synuclein spread uh, throughout the whole brain. And here, this is just a, a rendering, 3D rendering of how the different plaques distributed across different regions. And one thing you can see is that they indeed spread uh, to a certain point, and then you start to see degeneration. And so if you just take a very, um, very, um, uh, overall view of this uh, spreading pattern, what you'll see is that uh, if we just take the uh, left hemisphere and a right hemisphere and look at the uh, plaque counts, you'll see that they increase very sharply uh, before like five months. And then after that, you're starting to see slow decay in both hemispheres. And another trend you can see is that at different time points, post-injection, uh, you'll see that the size of the aggregates are distributed differently where Early on, there are smaller ones, large ones increase, and then the larger ones actually start to decrease uh, where you uh, stabilize to a different size point. And so in order to quantify this, uh, what we have then done uh, was to take uh, these uh, methods and put into a pipeline where we can quantify the aggregate locations and size and also use the uh, right field images to do the anatomical registration. And once we had all of these registrations in place, what we could do was to do statistics across cohorts. And here uh, with the Allen reference atlas that we use, you can see voxel level statistics as well as regional segmentation that you do here. And these regional segmentations can then be converted into bar graphs like this, where you can see which areas have uh, decreased or increased in plaques. And here, what you're seeing is the comparison between cohorts at different time points, 0.5 months post-injection to four months post-injection, four to eight, eight to 18. And this is uh, the density and the mean size. And you can see that the density actually uh, increases quite a bit from 0.5 to four months post-injection. And there is differences in the increase versus decrease in different brain regions. It's not a very uniform effect. It changes uh, depending on which area you are, but the general trend is you increase and then decrease, uh, indicated, uh, indicated by red, uh, possibly due to degeneration in different parts while there is still continued increase. And then up to about 18 months, there's a predominantly decrease. And you can see that also with quantification of mean size. Uh, you see here, and this is summarized here, and this is what you will generally see as a trend. And in order to see if this generalizes across different injection sites, uh, we also injected into the olfactory bulb, substantia nigra, and dentic gyrus, and we saw a similar trend, even though here we only monitor up to four months in terms of how the size distribution changes. And this is a similar image that shows the 0.5 to four months uh, changes in density and mean size. And while at first, when we first got this data, we wanted to do very basic analysis. Is the spreading occurring according to Euclidean distance? Uh, retrograde, anterograde, and we found that it's generally more anterograde, uh, but this was only, um, you can only model that up to like a certain uh, time period while it's still spreading, but there are these degenerations that kick in, which made it difficult to quantify the data. So at that point, we just decided to computationally model the whole thing, uh, including spreading, aggregation, and degeneration. And so we took a model of interactions, equations uh, that were in the field, that define the relationship between spreading, aggregation, and degeneration. And we then uh, fit the data. Since we had the full quantification, we divided the region into 426 and the size of the, uh, the size bin into seven different size, which was also optimized computationally. And you can now see that there is a very good fit in different size bins, as well as the whole brain. Uh, and there's also good regional uh, correlation between what was simulated and what was the count that we measured using these 3D imaging technologies across different regions. And now that we have a fully computational model, what we could do was also um, do simulations. And here we just randomly picked different injection sites and saw if it uh, matched the experimental outcome and the correlation when the injection site was uh, 
olfactory bulb, you can actually see that the in silico simulation results also show best outcome in the olfactory bulb. And even if it's in the contralateral site, it generally performs better. And so uh, we found that indeed this uh, computational model was accurately able to capture the characteristics uh, in comparison to the um, experimental outcome. And also then uh, since all of our images were registered to the Allen Reference Atlas, we can look at its relationships to different gene expressions. And although early on we just quantified what the gene expression pattern looked like in relations to the um, spreading pattern, we could do things more quantitatively now that we had the model. And so using this model, what we did was to uh, use gene expression levels at each region to modify uh, how the uh, dynamics of the equations were weighted. And once we weighted them according to different gene expressions, uh, we found that, for example, for the spreading versus degeneration, uh, we found that different genes uh, result in better, um, better model fit. And for example, the spreading parameters, LERC2, uh, gave the best uh, model outcome. Uh, compared to many of the other known uh, Parkinson's related genes, while for the degeneration part, LAM3 gave better outcome compared to many other uh, known Parkinson's relevant genes, which suggests that given the uh, role we know about LERC2 and LAM3, it seems reasonable that it is giving a um, uh, information that may be relevant for finding what uh, the different roles of these gene expressions are. And also, if we just uh, categorize some of these uh, genes based on which cell types that they're most relevantly involved in. We find that for the spreading parameters, uh, it's not uh, necessarily the case, but for the um, de degeneration parameters, uh, mostly the oligodendrocyte and astrocyte relevant genes are involved in the degeneration aspect. And also when we uh, look at different injection site related information, uh, with the gene ranking that we use for the um, striatal injection, we get a similar distribution uh, shown here, which shows that it does generalize uh, across different injection locations, which also adds uh, confidence to our uh, modeling uh, effort here. And one of the main reasons why we wanted to do uh, quantify all of these different uh, spreading pattern was also because we wanted to then relate it back to how the um, neural activity contributes to the, uh, to the pathology underlying it. And one thing that we have found uh, repeatedly uh, through many of the experiments now is that the neural function change uh, changes underlying pathology and not in a local way, but uh, across uh, brain-wide regions. And uh, with stimulation, stimulations locally, uh, the red regions indicate where all the pathology was decreased by neuromodulation. And so this adds an uh, interesting uh, angle to how therapeutics and understanding of the mechanisms can be interpreted. And so in this particular example, what I wanted to show you was that uh, spreading and degeneration, especially the long-term monitoring that we did, which was lacking in some of the previous studies, uh, show that indeed it spreads and degenerates across time. And the brain clearing combined with machine learning-based segmentation and atlas registration allows quantification of plaque size and density uh, change across the whole brain and enables quantitative comparison across time. And here by using computational modeling, we were able to quantify how uh, this dynamics that we observe in four dimension now uh, can be attributed to different uh, spreading aggregation and degeneration mechanisms. And gene expressions across brain regions can be used to identify the role of different genes in spreading and degeneration, uh, which I, I showed you earlier. And then pathology across the whole brain is altered by neuromodulation. And combined study with optogenetics fMRI that I showed you earlier will reveal pathology, genetics, and function relationship. And I want to share with you another study uh, that was uh, recently done in collaboration with the Adriano Aguzzi lab. And here, what we have done using similar technology is, oops, can I go back? Okay. Uh, was used this uh, crystal imaging technique that was developed, another 3D um, histology technique that was developed in uh, the Aguzzi lab. And can I move slides? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, 
uh, what, what we were able to achieve was very fast 3D histology, where you can see that uh, compared to other techniques like clarity, uh, the clearing is achieved in a much faster timeline, which allows you to do much larger cohort studies in a more uh, time efficient manner. And using this technology, we um, uh, quantified the drug impact on APPPS1 mice. And we use the anti-A beta therapy and two different small molecules. And what we quantified here was the plaque count, plaque size, as well as plaque maturity based on uh, some of the earlier studies that show that uh, imaging at different wavelengths allow us to quantify maturity. We went through the same pipeline to quantify voxel-wise and also regional basis. And you can see that the density, size, and maturity, cha uh, maturity changes at a different age and with different drugs are quite distinct. And this is a very good summary of what the overall picture looks like. And here we see that uh, these two drugs, these two different small molecules, at five months, uh, you see that um, only one of the drugs gives a significant decrease. Red is decrease here, where a significant decrease in plaque density and there is also decrease and increase in plaque maturity that you see, uh, while there is also some change in the plaque size, but it's mostly the plaque count that is decreasing. Uh, and you can also see that there is regional dependence of all of this. While the other, other drug had no impact, uh, I mean, there was impact, but much less impact at this age at, of five months, while at the 14 months age, uh, the the same drug had no impact on any of these three measures, while uh, the maturity significantly increased and the size decreased in the um, using the other drug uh, that is labeled here, which shows that although many of these studies uh, and clinical trials that try to treat Alzheimer's uh, rely on mostly overall non-regional quantification. Uh, this clearly shows that the region and age and uh, many different factors are distinct uh, for different drug groups. And so here, what we have shown is that Crystal enables fast clearing of brain tissue, brain clearing combined with machine learning based segmentation and atlas registration. In this case, allows quantification of plaque size, density, and maturity change across the whole brain, and enables quantitative comparison across cohorts uh, with different drug treatments. And different drug change, plaque density, maturity, and size at different age across different brain regions. And so overall, some of the uh, studies that I shared with you today show that whole brain function can be modeled at the single cell activity level. And this allows us to do things like optimal DBS target uh, prediction for Parkinson's disease. And brain clearing combined with machine learning based segmentation and atlas registration allows quantification of things like plaque size, density, and maturity, which we can then use to study its impact uh, across time and things like different drug treatments. And computational modeling is uh, starting to reveal uh, synaptic spreading, aggregation, and degeneration mechanisms. And we can also use it to identify a different genes role in spreading and degeneration uh, by having these um, models in place. And brain-wide pathology is altered by local neuromodulation. Uh, neuromodulation and different drugs change plaque density, maturity, size at different age across different brain regions. And we are now embarking on combined studies with OFMRI to reveal more close relationships between pathology, genetics, and function. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and my lab collaborators, as well as, oh, as, well as the uh, funding sources. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Jin, for the fantastic talk. I have a quick question. Um, you, you showed lots of beautiful images of the brain and spreading. Did you compare uh, oligomer versus fibers? Uh, you, you had only fibers imaging. Um, so we, we, we mainly just uh, imaged the plaque size. We haven't gotten into anything more detailed, but that is a natural next step to get more at the detail mechanisms. Okay, we have a, uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, Martin Musel. Uh, does spreading of large aggregates precede or follow changes in neuronal activity? Sorry? Does spreading of large aggregates precede or follow um, changes in neuronal activity. 
That's hard to tell at this point, but what we now know is that the neuronal activity definitely impacts the formation uh, and possible aggregation of uh, the plaques, uh, which shows that it is very important. Perhaps it is interactive, perhaps where the function degrades and then there is more plaque formation, and then it re results in more functional degradation and more. Which one comes first is unclear, but maybe to some extent that could be different for different people uh, or different disease conditions. But what's important is that they are interactive and they impact each other, which uh, is important for understanding the mechanism as well as uh, designing therapeutic uh, approaches. Oh, your second question is similar to what I asked, um, somewhat connected. I presume your technique follows the local fibril accumulation. Any idea how this relates to oligomer spread? Uh, we, we have no idea at this point, but that is something that we can start to tackle with the technologies that we have in place. I have another question. Uh, could, you, could you give some details on your technical aspect of imaging? What, what molecules are we imaging here and what experiment is it? What nuclei? Can you give Sorry. us some? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, what, what, what molecules are being imaged here? Is it water molecule? For the to get the image uh, from the NMR imaging. Oh, for the MRI imaging. Water? So yeah. MRI imaging is act imaging the brain activity. So it's blood oxygenation level dependent imaging, uh, where we see the intensity level correlate with the oxygenation level, which correlates with neural activity, which is why, why for example, uh, here, uh, when we see uh, with MRI increase in um, increase in downstream activity from uh, the inhibitory activity in the D1 MSN. We then see GPI activity increase, which is uh, what's measured with blood, blood oxygenation level changes uh, and which results in models like this where Y is inhibitory connection driving positive outcome. We always check with electrophysiology because it's an indirect measure of neural activity. And so here we go down, go in and checked all the uh, underlying spiking activity associated with that. And we see that indeed they correlate very well with MRI because of the indirect measure nature of the measurement. This has been a very hotly debated topic for a really long time in the whole field and it's still uh, being debated. However, uh, what we have found is that it often correlates very well with the directionality of the net neuronal activity increase and decrease regardless of cell type. And that has allowed us to not only understand the bold uh, blood oxygenation level dependent MRI mechanisms, but it allowed it, us to do this whole brain circuit level measurements uh, that um, we now have taken to a point where we can do simulations and predictions of uh, CBS therapy outcome. Okay, thank you, Jane. So we can take questions for both the speakers now. Uh, we can raise your hand uh, to join the panel to talk to the speaker directly. Um, Michele, do you like to read the questions for uh, Fabrizio? There are several. Yes. Um, so one question concerns uh, the binding site of the trodesquamine on alpha synuclein. Um, do we know that or related to that, whether it binds just to the membrane or if it creates or inhibits pore formation? Okay, the, uh, the questions from uh, Carmelo, I guess. So yes, the, you can read them as well. Yes, so um, the interaction of the drug with alpha-synuclein is a good point of view, and we were just designing experiments last month to uh, answer to that question. I think, Carmelo, it is a good point. You're right. There could be a direct interaction of the molecules with alpha-synuclein, and because historically we know that the molecule binds to the membrane, all the research so far has focused on the binding of the molecule on the membrane. But we cannot rule out, as you correctly argue, that the, there is an interaction with alpha-synuclein and we certainly have to, to, to address that. And uh, maybe uh, a few months later, we'll have the, the answer to that question. 
And the, the pore formation, again, is a good point. Uh, it could be that uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, an inhibition of the pore formation, although the concept the, the concept of pore formation is vague to me because uh, um, the 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 current through the membrane, the passage of ions is generally carried out through a destabilization of the membrane. I'm not sure that there is a, a, a clear pore, a clear channel formed uh, by the oligomers uh, in the membrane. Maybe the membrane just. Uh, destabilizes the membrane, we have a passage of ions. And so, um, so certainly uh, tridesquamine inhibits this passage of ions. I don't know if uh, because it interrupts the pores or other effect, but I think the main effect is the displacement of the oligomer. So if tridesquamine displaces the oligomers from the membrane, of course, there is no possibility for the ions to pass to the membrane. I think this is the, the main effect. And third, uh, the, the, so alpha sinu, the, 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 your question about the charge, alpha sinuclein is, uh, interacts uh, with, uh, with negatively charged uh, uh, liposomes uh, more effectively than uh, neutral and positively charged uh, liposomes. So there must be an interaction of alpha synuclein with uh, the negative charges. So tridesquamine is a positively charged molecule because of the polyamine, which uh, provides a, 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 a net positive charges. Uh, and so my feeling is that uh, there is a, a decrease of the negative charge of the membrane. This is observed experimentally through the zeta potential. We can see a decrease of the negative charge. And this is the main effect, I think, uh, on the charge provided by uh, tridesquamine. And so if you uh, decrease the net, the, the net negative charge of the membrane, there is a uh, 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 the, there is a, 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 a lower interaction of alpha synuclein with the membrane as well. I hope I answered all your three questions. So continuing on the membrane, uh, role of membrane and, and uh, your small molecule binding to the rafts, um, I think some questions are from Matthias Bach as well. Mm -hmm. So if it binds to the raft, rafts have other, act, other roles to play as well. So how selective are these small molecules for Parkinson or other diseases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yes, I don't know, Matthias. Actually, before this question, we have an exchange of messages with Matthias and uh, I don't know because, uh, um, okay, the rafts are altered through symptomatic for anything except alpha synuclein. So uh, alpha synuclein have uh, um, an effect on, uh, on uh, rafts because uh, um, there is an interaction and uh, whenever there is a toxicity, alpha synuclein can also interact with, uh, with rafts. So in the end, you have a double interaction, but uh, we don't know how this uh, interaction affects the specificity. So if your question is about uh, the various specific effects of sephiroth, I don't know. Can I ask? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned uh, squalamine and traduscamine for, you, you use them interchangeably at different places. Are there any differences in clinical outcome and experimental outcome that where you compare the two? Are they equivalent? Okay, so the, um, I think, uh, um, I cannot uh, answer to the question because uh, there, are, there are no clinical trials yet started with trodesquamine. You, you, uh, you, you have to know that uh, squalamine was the first one to be studied uh, with, with Chris, with Michele, and uh, so there was an initial study with uh, squalamine. And this, and when after the results of squalamine, came up, uh, we, uh, Michael Zaslov decided to uh, start a clinical trial on uh, squalamine. The results on tridesquamine came later. And uh, um, so the, the, the whole research on tridesquamine uh, uh, was later. And so far, 
the they they didn't start uh, any trial on on uh, um, on prodespamine because they thought they have a, a, a good candidate in squalamine, so they want to see the effects of squalamine before starting any new clinical trial on prodespamine. They are thinking more about Alzheimer's disease because there is a clear effect on Alzheimer's disease as well. Uh, but I think uh, they want to derivatize the molecules so that they can get a better trophism in the brain, a better, I mean, they, they want to use derivatives of trodesquamine so that the molecule gets better in the brain and has a longer life in the brain. In the, in the so, lab setting, was there any comparisons done in the lab setting, which... Sorry, any comparison about the... Uh, the clinical trial, I understand it was only done for a squalamine, but was there any comparison in lab settings, which shows? Um... Okay, in lab, in the lab, okay. In the lab, uh, uh, we, we have uh, data on uh, uh, trodesquamine and squalamine, that's right, and we can compare that, but the, the results are uh, on uh, animal models and particularly C. elegans. Uh, another group uh, also studied the effect on, uh, on mice and it seems uh, that uh, trodescomine is, uh, um, is more effective because it can produce similar data at lower doses. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are results in the lab with animal models. If your question is about uh, uh, human beings, uh, uh, no, because the I mean, you have to, I mean, we cannot do experiments on human beings, of course, in the lab, we need to go through clinical trials and uh, the, the, the molecule was not registered for, uh, for uh, clinical, I mean, the trodescomine, the second molecule was not registered for clinical trials, so I, I, I don't know. Aren't they currently used for other purposes? Yes, I mean, uh, yes, uh, a good question because, uh, Actually, the molecule interacts with the membrane and it uh, can reinforce the membrane. It is also an inhibitor, both, I mean, squalamine and trodescomine are uh, inhibitors of uh, the protein tyrosine phosphatase 1B, which is associated with a number of processes. So they... Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there, there is a, a, um, a consideration of the molecule for a number of diseases. And uh, um, so, yes, actually, I think the Enterin, which is the, the, the company started from Michael Zasloff, is mainly focusing on neurodegeneration. But in the past, there was a, an analysis of other diseases, in particular obesity and uh, um, so in principle, yes, it can turn out to be useful for other diseases, which are not even related with neurodegeneration. And they are available as supplements already, right? For yes, yes, yes. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. <laughs> so Christian is on the panel. He has questions and then Rock is. Christian. Uh, um, thank you much. I, I read uh, I read your answer in the in the comment yes. uh, also on the on the uh, brain concentration. Well, I was said uh, just quickly uh, looking in the clinical trials for 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 the Parkinson study, but could not find it. But then I found it is um, um, a molecule end zero one. It's uh, that one. It's that one. And uh, but, but that seems to be a, a modification because it's orally applied and, and the and the other one was IV. So so I mean is N01 uh squalamine. It is squalamine. Ah that's squalamine. Okay, okay. Yes. That was I, I was just not clear about. Okay. <laughs> well I think uh, I think for uh, commercial uses they decided to change the name, but uh, N01 is uh, is uh, squalamine, is exactly it's squalamine. Okay, okay. And that, and I don't I don't think it's a mystery. I mean uh, if you go through the literature, it's clear that N01 is uh, is squalamine. I, 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 I could not read on the papers. <laughs> so, okay. And they called the uh, trodesquamine N06. And so they also have a new molecule that is not disclosed. They called ENT03. So there, there is all these uh, names, but ENT01 is a squalamine. And uh, actually, if, if you go through the, the um, governmental um, site of uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, you can see 
uh, ANT01, and uh, it's basically squalamine. And you can see the various clinical trials on uh, constipation mm -hmm. with Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease with dementia. Yeah. And actually, the, um, the CARMET study is the one I was talking about, and mm -hmm. the the, the results, uh, I think I think there is a call to, to show the results next next week. And mm -hmm. so I haven't seen them myself uh, confidentially. I learned from Denise that they are, I mean, the, the, enter, the people in entering are very happy. So I I suppose they are very good and, uh, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't read them yet. Okay, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Rakis, go ahead. Uh, great talks, guys. Hey Fabrizio, so I have a question. Did, do you have plans to test the compounds using brain-derived aggregates from like BD versus MSA versus like synucleobatis, different synucleobatis to gain more insights about how it works? No, we don't have, uh, we don't have yet that. And uh, I mean, it's, um, it could be good uh, to have all these methods and uh, they, they are young molecules from that point of view and we, we, we haven't. We haven't developed any of these uh, methods. Thank Sorry, you. you answered the question from Christian Grissinger. Could you, um, it, it wasn't um, recorded here. Can, you, can we revisit that, the concentration of the molecules in vivo versus in vitro conditions? In vitro condition, can you comment on how much is the um, concentration needed to inhibit completely synuclein aggregation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the, in terms of uh, uh, suppression of oligomers, but suppression the toxicity of oligomers in cell cultures, we have uh, an effect starting from one micromolar, five macromolar, and so on. In uh, C. elegans, we can see a good effect even at lower concentrations. In uh, in uh, uh, suppression of uh, um, lipid-induced aggregation, we can have an effect at lower concentration because in that case, it stops primary and secondary nucleation. We don't need to have a one-to-one um, -one stoichiometry, stoichiometry. And uh, in vivo, uh, uh, we don't know um, because uh, it's hard to see the effects in the neurons in vivo and to see what the concentration in the brain is. Certainly, these molecules is uh, well tolerated because the patients, in particular in phase one clinical trials, you know that you give uh, an excess amount of the molecule to see the tolerability. And it seems that the patients can tolerate uh, a high concentration of molecules, uh, certainly higher than the ones where we see effect in vitro. So in C. elegans, when you inject, um, I assume that you inject these compounds uh, to C. elegans. Yeah, so we don't inject the molecule. We we give it in the. Uh, feed them. Uh, we we feed them. We feed them, and uh, so we can know the concentration in uh, in the in the medium, but in the body, the exactly the concentration is lower. So uh, they can go anywhere, right? Wherever there's a negative charge, they can bind, right? Yes. So yes. not necessarily where synuclein is going to be interacting that membrane. So do you see anywhere else in CL like in this being deposited or active? Uh, you mean in other organisms or in other? I mean, CL again, CL again, when you yeah. feed them, do you see anywhere else in the body? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that Michele can also answer to the question. And I think uh, that uh, it certainly goes to the gut but mm -hmm. it crosses the gut. It will be found in the, in the neuronal cells of C. elegans and in the muscles. Is so there, a possibility it, then there, there is a good diffusion of the molecule in C. elegans. It, it, exactly as you said at the beginning, I mean, uh, pro provided you have negative charges, it can go anywhere. And so there is a good diffu uh, diffusion of the molecule in the body. I don't know, Michele, if you want to, to add anything to that. So, no, no, that, 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 that's all right. As far as we know, it, uh, it can travel you know, quite uh, readily. So uh, that means, is, is there a possibility that the lipids are taking this compound from gut to brain, forming some kind of small aggregates, lipid-bound squalamine aggregates, maybe 
going inside the brain. Is that is that a possibility? It is a possibility. It is a possibility. Actually, this is a, a very important question, Rams, particularly for the human being, because there is this uh, brain uh, uh, gut axis. So it's clear that something that occurs uh, in the gut uh, also has effect uh, in the brain. So there could be a possibility that uh, there is a, a diffusion of a, a traveling of the molecule and uh, of the aggregates that are affected by the molecule from the gut to the brain. And so that's why the two organs communicate somehow. Is there anything known about these molecules for the cancer cells? Um, do they interact with the cancer cells? Yes, there, there was a study in the past. Um, um, cancer is not my field, so um, I don't, I can't remember. But certainly, yes, there, there are there are a few papers if you're interested on cancer, and um, I can provide the references. Uh, um, uh, yes, the, the, I mean, the, the studies were not that widespread, so there are only a few papers, but uh, there is something, yes, in the literature. Okay, I have a question. Go ahead, Rakesh. To Jen. So, Jen, what, what, what are your thoughts on the role of uh, inflammation in the spreading when you do the simulation or the real measurements? Um, actually, one of the things that we found through these experiments, these took a really long time. So this initial set of experiments started a long time ago before I knew the things that I know now. And one of the things that uh, was somewhat surprising is that despite all of these spread and all the things that are happening, these mice are kind of fine and they're very, uh, their behavior is not as dramatic. And so, um, it's clear that that alone, alpha-synuclein aggregation alone doesn't contribute to disease uh, by itself. And one of the key things that uh, I thought was a key contributor was uh, inflammation and the immune system interaction. And so in fact, we are now conducting those studies to answer those questions. And there is a clear, um, clear sense from the data and the modeling that we did that we can uh, quantitative look at things. And there are lots of regional dependence, which was not very well quantified before. And so um, this, the, this interaction between the immune system and the um, alpha-synuclein distribution and the genes seem to be very critical in understanding that. It's what I learned through the study <laughs> as well. Yeah, but once you establish it, it should not be hard to. Right, and and there are some clear clear hypotheses we can form by looking at these, and it's actually been very powerful to be able to, you know, test out like is this gene contributing to this spreading, and like if we add this immune component, what will happen, and also the fact that the functional interactions can now be single cell level modeled. Uh, gives us very powerful, very accurate experimental paradigms we can design. And so we are looking at that very question that you just, you're just giving, yes. Thank you. Uh, Jin, there's a question from Carmelo Larosa in the Q&A for you. A nice talk with your technique. Can you detect the amyloid plaques? Can you distinguish if they are inside or outside the cell? That's a good question. The second study is where we were doing amyloid plaques. And uh, yes, so any kind of plaques, uh, as long as they can be labeled, we can image. This is using 3D histology. And so the, the question there is yes, in terms of inside and outside of cells, that would require multiple different staining and high resolution imaging to do that. But theoretically, that's all possible. So uh, Fabricio, I, I have a question for you. So it, it's clear that your compounds are positively charged and then that would interact with any negative charge molecules, which is anionic lipids, that would screen uh, synuclein binding to membrane. So that's the model you have. So primary nucleation is avoided. But if you have already existing, pre-existing synuclein oligomers, we are the compounds, so they get detached and then they don't aggregate. But if they're already helical, they should be further aggregating to form fibers, right? Yes. Even if they are detached. Yes, yes. It, you mean if, if you have other molecules that are alpha helical or alpha synuclein? Alpha synuclein. 
Okay. Yes, alpha synuclein. Uh, there is a detachment of the monomer as well. So mm -hmm. they um, maybe through a similar uh, mechanism involving the charges, and uh, so the particularly because the 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 n terminus is positively charged of alpha synuclein. So the it can be a similar a similar effect even with the alpha helical portion of the molecule. All right, I think uh, there are no other questions. Thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio and Jin and uh, Miguel and others for uh, this great talk and um, great discussions. Thank you. So we can pleasure. Conclude the session. Thank, Thank you. All. That's fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to everyone. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.